Jill Heinerth from Toronto, Canada, living in High Springs, Florida, right across the street from the cave divers mecca, Ginny Springs. We've been talking a lot about exploration and fear and survival. What are those sort of esoteric traits that um, help someone survive those really bad days out? And is fear something to be concerned about or something to be embraced? I think that fear is an important part of what keeps us alive. You know, I've told people that um, if you don't embrace fear, you're going to spend the rest of your life running from it. And in cave diving or any sort of exploration diving, I think it's really important to have that healthy amount of fear because that's the self-respect that um, gets you home at the end of the day. You know, I don't want to dive with someone that's fearless. I um, I'm afraid to dive with people that aren't afraid. <laughs> Um, so I think it's, it's an important component. Um, how you deal with stress is, is really what makes the difference sometimes between survival and not coming home. And I think that you can train yourself to deal with stress. Not even just inside the diving envelope, but outside in, in, in your greater life. Early on as a uh, young woman, I was about 21 years old, I fought off a burglar in my home who uh, entered the house, um, started rifling through cabinets and drawers, and he knew that I was upstairs. I was making noises upstairs, and I heard this man rifling through the house and working his way towards me. I'd been living in the house for one day. I'd moved into this home. I had no phone attached. I couldn't get out the bedroom window because I'd be dropping into a street. And I thought to myself, how am I going to deal with this unbelievably stressful condition? My first reaction was to pull the covers over my head and hide. And I realized that that was absolutely ridiculous. You know, I had to push the emotions of fear aside and confront the situation head on. And as this man rifled his way through the house and worked his way closer and closer, I had to go through the stages of dealing with stress. You know, what tool could I use? to assist me in this situation. I looked around the room and I thought, I need a weapon. I need a weapon. I'm, you know, I'm Canadian, we don't have guns. Right? <laughs> so I looked over to a bookshelf that I had propped up with bricks holding a plank of wood and I thought, there, I'll take a brick and I could throw it at him. And I thought second about that, that pitch of a brick and I thought well then he's going to have this tool what you know what am I going to do that's more effective and I found some exacto knives and I wrapped them into my fingers and held tight and I thought I will not let go of the knives I will not let go of the knives and I was a total pragmatist what is the next best step towards survival I don't know how this is going to end up right now I know the next best thing is to have these knives and I sat in the darkness until this man busted his way through my bedroom door and came after me and I turned on the light on my drafting table light and blasted in his face and thought that would be enough to startle him. But when he came after me, I had nothing left but to swing and slash across his chest. And I cut him. And he stepped back. And in this like, hideous laughter, he looked at me, turned around, and walked out of the house. And I was absolutely terrified. I just wanted to fall apart, but I realized it wasn't time yet. I wasn't safe yet. And I ran to the nearby subway station out the front door of my house and got help. And it was only after the police arrived that I could let go of these knives and drop them on the ground and just crumble into tears. But I realized that experience taught me so much about stress and dealing with fear. You have to be able to make the next pragmatic step towards survival and keep working relentlessly, relentlessly towards that end. In my worst ever cave dive, I had a situation where a diver in front of me was stuck. This diver was the cork in the bottle containing my life. This diver had become entangled in the line, broken the line, and I was holding the bitter end of a line in one hand and a stuck diver in the other hand in the murky darkness of zero visibility. And people could think that that's absolutely the worst possible situation. But all I was thinking about was how I was going to survive this. What's the next logical step? 
And when you break it down that way and you say emotions, you won't serve me now, and you focus on survival, then that's what gets you home. In that dive, I ended up throttling a tank on and off in order to deal with a regulator that had become so clogged with clay. I unstuck my buddy. I patched the guideline three times. I worked my way out of a zero visibility silt out in a cave about that high. And I made it home with half my gas, half my gas. So there was conservative planning before the dive started, but there was complete control of, of the emotional situation and the breathing rate in the dive. And I think that's critical. If you're trained, you're prepared, you have the proper emergency plan, and you've walked into a dive saying, I am capable of the worst case scenario. I am capable of self-rescue. I am capable, willing, and able to execute a buddy rescue on this dive. If you can answer those questions as yes, then you're gonna come home if you just use the tools that you've provided and trained for. And, and I think that is, it's the biggest picture. If you have that vision of the positive outcome, one single step at a time, then that's everything you can possibly do. The last element in the rule of survivors, as I call it, is the understanding that you have to know when you've almost reached the treasure and you're almost there within the vision of complete and total success. And you have to be able to say no, not today. I have to turn around. I have to abort, I have to skip the dive, or I have to turn around. In rebreather diving, there's no question that that will save your life. If we look at the rebreather accidents over the last 10, 20 years, if, if we line them all up, we can see that most of these accidents could have been prevented by, the, by actions taken before someone even got in the water. So with rebreathers, if you do a full checklist with your rebreather either on paper or through the automated controls of your rebreather. If you sit down, pay attention and do a five minute pre-breathe on your rebreather, plugging your nose and watching your displays. And then if you fail, don't get in the water. If you fail any of those checks, those three things, pre-dive checklist, pre-breathe and don't get in the water if something's wrong. And then if you do get in the water, abort if something happens. If you follow those simple rules, you'll come home. And it doesn't matter if you're in Truck Lagoon or if you're in a place that you've paid a lot of money to and, uh, and it's taken everything to get there. You have to be willing to turn around when you're almost there, almost ready to get in the water, almost ready to see the dive of your life. Because if you want to have another one, you've got to be hard and fast in that rule. So I think as explorers or divers in general, uh, all of that is important for our survival. Embrace fear, understand it, but leave the emotions behind. Control your breathing, work pragmatically towards survival, and then prevent those things that can go wrong by being diligent and uncompromising with your preparation for the dive. And with those things, I think it'll save your life.